Nation's annual coverage of the Memorial Day Parade services here at Town Center. It is a beautiful day today. Uh, lovely breeze, somewhere in the 60s, and we have a terrific crowd as usual that has come out to appreciate and honor the Memorial Day services that are conducted here. This is the 155th anniversary of the founding of a Memorial Day by the Grand Army of the Republic. There have been services that have already begun at Town Hall, where we had some welcoming remarks from Beth Cassavant, from the Select Board, and from State Representative Hannah Kane, who will both be uh, walking in today's parade. We're just waiting for services to start for the parade uh, uh, formation to start coming through here into town center. And it should be shortly. We uh, have heard what usually proceeds, which are police and fire uh, sirens. And we've started to hear some of that in the distance. So we know things will be beginning very shortly. To let you know what you're going to expect from our program today, We'll have welcoming remarks from John Travers. He's the master of ceremonies and he's an adjutant from the Raystone Post. He will also be giving, there, the, there go the sirens, he will also be giving this year's memorial address. And he is Major John Travers. Uh, in between his welcome and his address, we'll be hearing the Gettysburg Address by Sakath Madhusudan of the Shrewsbury High Speech and Debate Team. We're going to hear a selection by the Shrewsbury Oak Middle School 7th and 8th grade band. There'll be the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Kaylee Bailey, Kayla Bailey and Eko Tanaka of BSA Troop 7114. Uh, there's a reef ceremony and a salute. That will be conducted by the Victor R. Quaranta American Legion Post 397. And of course, taps will be played by two members of the Shrewsbury High School Band, Kieran Jadella and Chase Orchuk. Services after here in the center of town will continue on to Mountain View C Cemetery where there will be a uh, national anthem and that will be sung by members of the Shrewsbury High School Chamber Choir, a reading of General Logan's orders by William Prince of the Shrewsbury High Speech and Debate Team, another reef ceremony and salute uh, by the Victor R. Quaranta American Legion Post 397. Taps again played by Kieran Jadella and Chase Orchuk, and a benediction by Monsignor Michael Rose. There will also be the reading of veterans' names of town memorial squares by members of the Shrewsbury Scouts and a selection by the Shrewsbury High School Band. We will not have live coverage of the Mountain View Cemetery services. However, we will have taped portions that you can uh, look for rebroadcasts of all of the ceremony on the Shrewsbury Media Connection YouTube webpage. And I've just been told that on Channel 28, there will be a rebroadcast this evening on Channel 28. So, while we are waiting for things to begin, the Memorial Day Parade, or Memorial Day, was originally Decoration Day. And it was so called because people felt compelled by wanting to remember the fallen heroes and fallen members of the armed services uh, for the originally was the Civil War. And uh, families, children would take flowers, they would find the memorials for these fallen uh, war heroes and they would decorate their graves. This tradition went on for quite a while in different communities until in 1868 the ceremony was nationalized. It was still considered Decoration Day until it was more formally called Memorial Day, which is what we have today. 
and once again you probably just heard another siren and you can see there's an emergency vehicle coming through most likely the ceremony is very very near and again the crowd is starting to anticipate things coming you can hear the sirens and we know that the parade is going to start coming through town center memorial day is for veterans or soldiers who have fallen in service we have veterans day for veterans of all service but we have memorial day so that we can remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice on all our behalf and we can never repay that it's a gratitude that we we give and a debt that can never be repaid and uh, i'm sure that in the remarks that we hear today we will hear there are stories that service people carry with them always of men and women that they served with things that they've seen and sacrifices that have been made so we are now starting to see that the vehicles are coming a little bit closer and again the anticipation rising from the crowd they can see that the parade is just about ready to come through town center you can see uh, we have a police officer on a bicycle which i think we're going to be seeing a little bit more of now that the weather has gotten warm and uh, that's uh, probably a little bit easier for uh, some of the police members to be able to just travel through and um, be a little bit more mobile in some of the uh, street areas right around here around town center speaking of town center and the police we have the new police station that is uh, seems to be just about completed and the demolishing of the old police station so lots of changes here in Shrewsbury but one thing that hasn't changed is people's appreciation of the services that we have for you today In addition to the sirens, we can now start hearing. Uh, one of the bands is playing some kind of cadence as they're coming through. And you can probably see there are children who are kind of really hard leaning in to the sights and sounds they're hearing wanting to know what's going on with all those sirens. And while we are waiting for things to continue here, I would just like to say that um, these parades, annual parades, have been organized over the years by Angela Snell, who's no longer uh, here organizing things for Shrewsbury. It is now Laurel Rossiter, who's the new director of recreation, along with Kevin Esposito, who have brought these parade ceremonies to us. And we thank them. And as you can see, we have the fire department coming through, showing their axes and their flags. And that's their parade representatives. And we have some folks uh, uh, leaning out of a police car waving hello to us. 
some kids getting a special ride. And just behind the fire truck, just starting to come into view, we have our select board. We have Beth Cassavant, John Samia, Carlos Garcia, and uh, we also have uh, Michelle Conlin and Teresa Flynn that are part of our select board. You can see John Travers is starting to come to the podium for the services to begin. And as the Shrewsbury High School Band comes through, uh -huh. again, they will not be playing here. We will be hearing from the Oak Band And we have some veterans of uh, some of the uh, different wars. You can see by their caps and by the uniforms that they wear. And they're getting very, very warm round of applause from everyone here. And in the Jeep, we have Arthur Dobson, a Korean War vet. And behind him, another Korean War vet in the uh, car right behind the Jeep is Don Gray. Driven by Bob Holland. Me Dean Gannett is driving the Jeep, I am told. Thank you both. And as you can see, uh, right behind these two Korean War vets getting a special ride, we have Veterans Inc. coming through. And again, just continuous applause from the very appreciative crowd. And it looks like we have some more vets coming through in special cars getting a special ride. And again, I'm sure you can hear the uh, continuous round of applause as Veterans Inc. has gone by, the crowd heading up toward the top of the formation, and also for the vets in the various cars that we have here. Troop 7114, clearly a large troop, uh, Girl Scout, Boy Scout, Cub Scout, troops of all kinds, very, very well supported here in town. The, the, the groups do a lot for the kids, the kids do a lot for the groups, and a lot for town. If you visit the Shrewsbury Public Library, and we certainly hope you do, oftentimes you will see in their main case as you walk in, there will be uh, visible projects, different kind of uh, events or organizations or good works that certain troop members have worked on or have completed. And we have Cub Scouts moving through. It says, do your best. A great motto for us all. And as the troops continue to move through town center, in the distance we can hear 
what I believe will be the Shrewsbury Oak middle band. We can hear them in the distance. And coming through, as you can see, we have some more troops coming through. And I could be wrong, but I think blue is for Campfire Girls, followed by Girl Scouts. And as you can see, we have more than one Boy Scout troop, more than one Girl Scout troop. And in another special car, we have Gabrielle Griffiths, Miss Worcester County, Natalie Ehrensbeck, Miss Blackstone Valley, Kayla O'Hara, Miss Worcester's County's team, Julie Antetomaso, Miss Blackstone Valley's team, all getting a special ride. And we also have some Shrewsbury sweethearts. They're walking, but the other ladies are in the convertible. Well, he certainly picked a good day to be out in a convertible. And it looks like um, the ceremony at the podium is about to begin. Again, John Travers giving the welcome. He's the master of ceremonies. And we're going to turn things over to him. Good morning. I'm Major Retired John Travers. I'm the Master of Ceremony for the 2023 Memorial Day Parade. I thank you all for joining us today. Joining me today are State Representative Hannah Kane from our Shrewsbury Select Board, our Chairman Beth Casavant, John Samia, Michelle Conlin, Carlos Garcia, Fire Captain Sean Lawler, and Police Chief Kevin Anderson. Today is obviously a very special day. We take this day to set aside to honor the men and women who have given their lives on behalf of our country as we value their commitment, their sacrifice, and those they've left behind. Starting today's ceremony, we'll have the Gettysburg Address, as written, as, excuse me, as performed by Saketh from the Shrewsbury High School Speech and Debate Team. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but they can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this country, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So first, I'm remiss in mentioning that James Kane, our moderator, is also with us. Sorry about that. <laughs> John. So as I said before, welcome to our 2023 ceremony. I've been honored for the last few years to serve as the master of ceremony after the passing of the great Walt Joste. This year, when the Memorial Day Committee started to meet to discuss who would be the guest speaker, I asked, it was my 40th anniversary from graduating from the Military Academy, and this week was actually my 41st anniversary, I asked if I could talk about the meeting of service and remembrance. So today is the day we honor and show our respect for those men and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. It truly is a day of remembrance. Remember our fallen heroes, remember their sacrifice, their valor, their services. When we see those grave markers at places like Arlington, at local cemeteries in Normandy, we remember that each of those markers represent a precious life, a husband, a father, a wife, a daughter, a spouse. This day is remembered throughout the world by many nations who honor their fallen. Many of our allies, England, France, the Canadians, it's November 11th, the end of the First World War. For the Australians and New Zealands, it happens to be in April when they suffer their greatest losses at Gallipoli. For our South Korean, allies, it's in June, the start of the Korean conflict. The importance is, for our country, it started in Gettysburg, the day of our greatest loss, when often fathers and sons fought against each other. By the late 1860s, Americans in various towns and cities began holding springtime tributes to these countless fallen soldiers, decorating their graves with flowers and reciting prayers. On May 30th, General Logan from the Grand Army of the Republic said that from now on it would be a national day of remembrance, the 30th of May, with the adorning of flowers at local cemeteries. Memorial Day each year, Americans set time for the sacrifice, the profound sacrifice of the hundreds of thousands of Americans who have given their lives for the ideals of our Constitution and the love of our country. As I sat there in my 40th reunion, the weekend always starts the same. We're at the Protestant chapel. Typically, a roommate or a spouse brings forward a candle to remember the classmate that has passed. As a cadet, 
When a classmate passed, we would form on the plane of the parade field as taps were sounded and 4,000 cadets would stand there paying their honors. When we graduated in 2000 and in 1982, we all went off to our officer basic course. We're happy to be there with typically, in my case, 100 of my classmates that chose infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia. A couple of weeks into our training, the commanding general called us together, told us we were members of the profession of arms, we were part of the combat arms, and loss, unfortunately, was part of the job that we had chosen. He told us that training, when realistic, unfortunately can bring about loss, and one of our classmates, Chris, had just passed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. A couple weeks later, we were called back again. One of our infantry brothers, Barry, passed at Airborne School that morning at Fort Benning, Georgia. Shortly afterwards, we were called together to find out one of our other classmates died at Fort Rocker, Alabama, in aviation school. So within our first couple of weeks as graduates, we learned that the military comes with a price, and our job is to remember those who passed. When I was sent to Germany as a commander, I had the privilege of commanding two companies, a rifle company and a headquarters company. Your job is responsible for the training and the health, welfare, and morale of all your soldiers. It's an all-encompassing job. Whether they get in debt, they have marital problems, sometimes after 30-day deployment, you get a call from the military police if someone's had some drunken, disorderly behavior, and you go down to get them out of the local police station. You're with them from 6 o'clock in the morning, all day, starting with physical fitness, throughout the duty day, and then often going to intramurals to watch your soldiers play football, basketball, and softball. They become a family. But you always know with the 200 days we spend a year in the field training, that realistic training sometimes brings about loss, and it was our responsible to try to do what we could to minimize that loss. Unfortunately, coming back from Grafenwehr, our gunnery, we were there day and night, I had a soldier that was wounded. I spent all weekend waiting for the call from his mother, who I had spoken with, because he was one of my soldiers who had indebtedness issues. I finally got the call. Mom was going to fly in with Grandma on Sunday, and then I was able to take them to see their son at the local hospital. I got back, took them to the hotel after a visit, and an hour later, got a call from my battalion commander that he had passed. I'll always remember putting on my dress uniform, picking up Father Ken, my priest, knocking on the door just before midnight. And the sight of that light as they opened the door, saw us in our full dress uniform, yelled no, as I caught his mother and brought her to the couch to try to console her about the loss. We spent the next few days preparing for his memorial and his eulogy with 900 soldiers at our theater to say goodbye. As a major as an operations officer in Korea, we had a new base commander, Colonel Craig Robinson, great guy from Arkansas. He was a special forces soldier. He had spent the last 10 years of his life deployed with special forces fifth group and working at special operations command. Often after work, we'd go for a run with each other Sometimes we'd go to the officers' club and have dinner. One Friday night, he asked me if I wanted to watch the movie Patriot Games because he had been part of his time doing what was in that movie. We went to the movie Saturday morning. I took the train down to see my wife in Seoul, and a couple hours later, I got the call that after the fun run on base, doing the run, high-fying all the soldiers, Craig went into cardiac arrest they worked on him for 40 minutes and were not able to revive him. As the colonel called me and told me what happened, I reminded him that Colonel Robinson's wife, Janet, and his two daughters, Courtney and Hillary, were arriving in country that day into Korea after not seeing Colonel Robinson for six weeks. And unfortunately, the colonel had to meet them at the airport and give them that news. I remember what an honor it was to be there at his ceremony 
his memorial ceremony at Camp Red Cloud with so many special operations soldiers, rangers, SEALs, Green Berets who had made the 18-hour flight to Korea, and many of which were then going to follow him to Arlington for his burial. But I couldn't help but continue to look at his wife and daughters and think about how they had come for a wonderful reunion and had received such terrible news. When 9-11 occurred, I was at Devon's Mass working in ROTC, supervising the 21 colleges and 38 high schools in the East Coast. When 9-11 happened, that night I went home to 200 emails talking from my classmates about who was at the Pentagon, who saw who, and took till 2 in the morning until all my classmates were accounted for. The very next day, I received a call from the casualty assistance office at Fort Drum informing me that there was no active duty bases in New England, so we would do all notification of next of kin. Again, I was thinking of the military and all my classmates that were there, not thinking of the 20,000 people who worked at the Pentagon, many of which were civilian. My first call was actually an 18-year-old young lady from Framingham, Mass, graduated high school, went to secretarial school, and decided it'd be great to work for the government. Probably thinking, this is wonderful. I'm in D.C., cherry blossoms, museums, history. And unlike us, who at least prepare for the inevitable that we may give our lives, where typically when we deploy, we redo our wills, make sure our insurance policy is up to date. We all have that letter. If you're reading this, I didn't make it back, but I'm honored and privileged to have given my life for our country and our way of life. As I spoke to the captain at Boston University, who had to give that mission of knocking on that door and saying on behalf of a grateful nation and the Secretary of Defense, I regret to inform you that your daughter passed away at the Pentagon on 9-11. I told him about my experience in Germany and how hard it was going to be. He called me back shortly before midnight to tell me he had completed his mission and said, sir, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. At my reunion, one of two of the classmates we honored were classmates who gave their lives in the war on terror, Rocky and Brian. Brian was a surgeon who was there as a doctor flying to inspect all the hospitals to make sure our soldiers had the best of care when a shoulder-fired rocket took down his helicopter. Rocky was lieutenant colonel driving his Humvee to check on his soldiers when an IED took his life. So this day is all about remembering and honoring those who have lost their lives through military service on behalf of our country and our freedom. I think of so many mothers and wives, husbands and fathers, extended family and friends who do their best every day to ensure their loved one is remembered. They carry on each day with pictures on the mantle and mementos of a life not fully lived. They carry on the understanding that their soldier chose his life of service, and thus they understand the potentiality of their death as a sacrifice for the sake of our freedom. Today, we honor the families of those lost, for they bear a burden that none of us can comprehend. It is our responsibility as citizens to remember our nation's brave fallen men and women, whether they died on foreign lands in the heat of battle or during training or after a lifetime of service to their country. Never forget the men and women who know all too well the cost of our freedom for their service to this country is their greatest gift. As President Reagan said in 1982, their lives remind us that freedom is not bought cheaply. It has a cost. It imposes a burden. And just as they whom we commemorate were willing to sacrifice, so too must we in a less final, less heroic way, be willing to give of ourselves. As we honor their memory today, let us pledge that their lives, their sacrifice, their value shall be justified and remembered for as long as God gives us this great nation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speaking today. God bless those military and women, men and women deployed today in harm's way, providing us the opportunity to enjoy this beautiful day. God bless our fallen heroes. God bless our great nation. 
And God bless you. Thank you. We will now hear a selection played by the middle school eighth grade band. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We will now be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Troop 7114, led by Scouts Caleb Bailey and Aiko Tanaka. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have the wreath playing by Victor Kronta, American Legion Post 397. Taps will be played by Karen and Chase, so please make sure we bring our units to present arms.
Please give us a minute or two while we make sure our veterans are back in their vehicles and we will then resume our movement down to the cemetery. Thank you. And that concludes the program here at Town Center. Um, another moving uh, address, uh, Major John Travers, the guest speaker. Um, personal recollections, uh, a, a good deal of, of the experience of what it is to have the awesome responsibility not only to serve but to to have to impart when people have passed loved ones have passed in service uh, certainly the sense of what life is like the the bond the brotherhood the sisterhood of serving the lifelong commitment well past one's service the memories never fade, they never should, they never will. It's what this day is all about. And again, we can only be thankful and grateful for those who, who feel the call to serve and how important it is for all of us. And we're very grateful. And we thank you, as always, for joining us here at Shrewsbury Media Connection in our bringing you the live coverage here at Town Center of the now past 155th anniversary of the founding of Memorial Day. As I had mentioned, the services are going to continue on to Mountain View Cemetery. We will be bringing portions of that, but uh, on rebroadcast. There is a rebroadcast on Channel 28 at 7 p.m today uh, and you can check the Shrewsbury Media Connection YouTube webpage for additional rebroadcasts. It's been our privilege as always. We wish you a good Memorial Day and um, stay safe. We'll see you next year. I now welcome the high school chamber choir who will lead us in the national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we had at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars are the ramparts we watched, our so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare. The bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Always my favorite part of the ceremony is hearing them sing. We will now hear the reading of General Logan's orders by William Prince, a member of the Shrewsbury High School speech and debate team. The 30th day of May, 1868, 
is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of those comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized, comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead, who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foes? Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to her slain defenders. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of irreverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time testify to the present or to the coming generations that we as a people have forgotten the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull, other hands slack, other hearts cold in the solemn trust, then ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain to us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us in this solemn presence renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us, a sacred charge upon a nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. It is the duty of the commander in chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to lend its friendly aid in bringing to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use efforts to make this order effective. By order of John A. Logan, Commander in Chief. Thank you, William, for that great recitation. We will now have the reflang and salute by Victor Kronta, Post 397, and taps played by Karen and Chase. So please be prepared to bring your units to present ours.
Thank you, Fred. We will now have a benediction from Monsignor Michael Rose from St. Mary's Parish. Let us pray. Lord God, creator of life and all good things, pour forth your blessings upon your people this day as we gather together as the community of Shrewsbury to remember and honor all who have gone before us, especially our veterans and most especially those who have died in service of our country. We know for sure that the bonds of love and affection and family that bind us together in our lives, in our communities across this land, that they do not die when we do. And so we are here this day in this place of peaceful rest for those gone before us to remember all of our veterans, to remember our beloved, many whom we do not even know, but we honor and remember them this day. Send us forth then from this day with your blessing and a renewed commitment for us to work together to build a just society and a world at peace. Amen. We will now have the reading of the veterans' names of the town memorial squares by our members of our various scout organizations, the 31 squares honoring some of our own local fallen that span six wars. Private First Class Homer E. Bassar, World War II. Staff Sergeant Edward F. Wisaki, World War II. Captain Isaac Harrington, Revolutionary War. Private First Class Brian M. Mokin, Jr., Afghanistan. Brian E. Stone, World War I. Sergeant Raymond Stone, World War I. Private First Class Robert J. McGuire, D uh, World War II. Robert E. Martin, World War I. Tech Sergeant Joseph D. McGarry, World War II. Staff Sergeant Charles J. Murphy, Vietnam. Staff Sergeant Victor R. Gordon, World War II. Private First Class Harold J. Salvatore, World War II. Lieutenant William M. O'Donnell, World War II. Lieutenant Colonel Walter J. Patton, World War II. Julius T. Benedict, World War II. James E. Conlin, World War I. Corporal Alan E. Duke, World War I. PFC Richard D. Fiffin, World War II. Staff Sergeant Walter F. Johnson, World War II. Sergeant Melvin Kaiser, World War II. Sergeant Bernard F. Kramick, World War II. Francis S. McGuire, World War I. Private James Schooler, World War I. Private First Class James F. Sheehan, World War II. Private Joseph W. Hickey, World War I. Sergeant Lloyd E. Hill, Korea, Private First Class. Carl A. Johnson, World War II. Captain Winthrop Avery, World War I. Homer Gage, Jr., World War I. Sergeant Carl Thierbeck, World War II. Herbert B. Hapgood, World War I.
Thank you, scouts. It's important on this day of remembrance that we keep in mind our local heroes who have passed that come from our town. Now we will have a selection by the Shrewsbury High School Band. Thank you, they're always outstanding. So in conclusion, I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. Let's not forget the price that is paid for our freedom, our way of life. As they say, freedom is not free, it's paid for in the blood of American young men and women in the service of our country. Franklin Roosevelt said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy forget in time that men have died to win them. I want to thank our amazing park and recreation staff, Director Laura Rossiter, Kevin Esposito, Gary Grindle, Jessica Rubokis, our Veteran Planning Committee, all of our wonderful participants who've joined us today for making this such a solemn day as we honor our fallen heroes. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for being part of this great day, this great tradition, as we think of all those men and women who gave their lives for our freedom and our way of life. So I thank you, enjoy the rest of the day, and a reminder for the veterans, we'll have a barbecue back at Raystone Post. Thank you so much.